Welcome to The Daily Show Global Edition. I'm Roy Wood Jr., host of the award-winning CP Time. And in honor of Black History Month, Trevor has asked me to introduce the show. But before we begin, some news out of Spain, where authorities have shut down an international criminal gang that trafficked in stolen cardboard. So now if you want a huge amount of cardboard, you just have to buy something from Amazon. Thanks for somehow shipping me that wristwatch in five separate boxes. Here are this week's headlines. Let's kick it off with the big news, Equifax. Some people know them as a credit reporting agency. Others know them as a player hater that stops you from buying your couch. <laughs> well, you may remember that they were at the heart of a massive data hack, and now we're finding out how it all went down. Good evening. It was one of the biggest cyber attacks in history, stealing the personal information of nearly half of all Americans, from our social security numbers to birth dates. Now, in a stunning announcement, the U.S. Justice Department is accusing a branch of the Chinese military with the 2017 hack of the credit rating company Equifax. The Chinese team hid their tracks by using 34 servers in nearly 20 countries. The FBI believes China also hacked Marriott, the U.S. government's personnel office, and insurance giant Anthem, as it builds a massive database on every American. That's right. China is allegedly stealing people's private information to build a massive database on every American. And you know somewhere right now, Mark Zuckerberg is like, back off, China, that's my thing. <laughs> but seriously, though, I don't, I don't understand this. Like, China is beating the U.S. in everything right now. Why would they steal Americans' information? And this is just to rub it in everyone's faces, you know, just like, ha-ha, I know the answers to your security questions. Your first car was a Kia, what a bitch. <laughs> What's even weirder is that they say China also may have hacked Marriott. And I mean, I get credit agencies, insurance companies, and the government, but why are they hacking hotels? What, are they just gonna tank the U.S. economy by adding charges to the minibar? Is that what they're doing? <laughs> no, because let's be honest, like, everyone is just three Toblerones away from bankruptcy. We're out. <laughs> Those minibars don't play. And I know some people were saying that China's doing this so that they can steal Americans' identities. Yeah, but if that's true, the joke's on them, because half of Americans are in debt. Yeah, so if the Chinese steal those identities, it's gonna backfire. It's like, I am Brian Taylor now. It's like, okay, Brian Taylor, you over Ryzen $400. No! <laughs> All right, moving on to some education news. Every public school struggles to raise money for its students and teachers. But a fundraiser at one elementary school in California might have backfired. Disney sent a $250 bill to a California elementary school after it showed last year's remake of The Lion King at a PTA fundraiser. On Thursday, a Berkeley elementary school received a letter from Disney's licensing agent, and the letter ordered the school to pay the money for screening the movie last November without a license. The Disney place wanted some money because they own, like, all of the movies. They showed the movie that they own, so they want the $250. Well, kind of, they kind of want the $250. Oh, no, young man. Disney doesn't kind of want the $250. <laughs> Disney's gonna get the $250. Yeah, right now, somewhere Yoda is like, my money bitch better have. <laughs> so, yeah, Disney sent a $250 bill to an elementary school for showing The Lion King. Meanwhile, the producers of Cats are giving $250 to every school <laughs> that shows their film. Please, play the movie, play the movie. Please, you can use this instead of spanking the kids. We're not monsters. <laughs> Now, I'm, like, this is what's getting... I'm sure there are many schools in America that play Disney movies and don't get busted. So what I want to know is, who snitched? <laughs> huh? Is there, like, one kid who had one of those toy phones that calls Mickey Mouse directly? Or was just like, Mickey, I got some valuable information. <laughs> Mickey was like, whoa, whoa, I'm on the way. I'm gonna break some kneecaps. <laughs> it's like, who was this kid? All right, and finally, Valentine's Day is just three days away. So, first of all, if you were planning to break up with someone, too late, now you have to wait another week. <laughs> but if you've already been broken up with, here's a little gift you can get for your ex. Valentine's Day fast approaching, and we have the perfect idea for a very unique gift or a way to get back at an ex. The Bronx Zoo <laughs> is once again letting people name a Madagascar hissing cockroach after their partner. That <laughs> gift will only cost you 15 bucks. 
If you're looking for a way to feel better about a recent breakup, zoos in San Antonio and El Paso, Texas will name a cockroach <laughs> after your ex. <laughs> then check this out. You can watch a live stream of that roach being fed to an animal. Really? Really? Man. I feel bad for the cockroaches. They can survive a nuclear war, but they can't survive Alan and Janet's Saturday at Ikea. Really? <laughs> and I'm sorry, but anyone who does this deserves to get dumped. They deserved it. Yeah, because you clearly don't know how to deal with your feelings. It's like, Melissa thinks I'm too emotional? Well, I'll show her by making a cockroach die. <laughs> also, what a cumbersome way to get revenge on your ex. Like, because they won't know it happened, <laughs> right? Unless you tell them. It's not like they're gonna be somewhere like, oh no, a cockroach with my name just died. <laughs> You're gonna have to call your ex and let them know what you did. Is that the plan? Just be like, guess what, Susan? I named a cockroach after you, then a lizard ate it. It's like, uh, okay, Greg, I just had my third kid with the guy I left you for. Okay, so, so we're both good then, huh? Three kids? Okay, bye. Hello, Bronx Zoo, I need three more cockroaches, please. <laughs> Also, can we admit that this is a scam that the zoo is running? Buy a roach from them and they'll kill it? No. You can just find a cockroach in your own apartment. <laughs> yeah, name it after your ex and then start dating it. All right, that's it for the headlines. Let's move on to our top story. <laughs> New Hampshire. It's the state always asking Vermont to do something about the weed smell. But today, <laughs> they were the state holding the second Democratic primary. And because normally the most exciting thing to do in New Hampshire is watch mountains grow, election day gets the people going like nothing else. After months of campaigning and millions of dollars in TV ads, it all comes down to this. Voters here in New Hampshire already heading to the polls. Overnight in New Hampshire, the first votes were cast in the Granite State. As they've done for decades, the tiny town of Dixville Notch went to the polls at midnight. We were in Exeter, New Hampshire, at the town hall there. It was beyond capacity. People have been coming in here all day. They've been lined up since 5 a.m. this morning. They vote for sport here in New Hampshire. I have voted for Warren. Stop. Why? He's cute. No, he seems like he can tackle Trump. I voted for Bernie. Um, I voted for Amy Klobuchar. Tell me why. Uh, I actually went in and eeny, meeny, miny, moed it. You're kidding no, me. No, between Literally two candidates. Literally in the booth. In the booth. Whoa. <laughs> eeny, meeny, miny, mo. That's not how you should pick your potential future president. Although it is how the president picks his spray tan shade for the day. <laughs> And it's like, itty mini mini mo. Ooh, creme brulee sounds fancy. <laughs> so fancy. So, New Hampshire voters spent the day carefully deciding who they want to be the Democratic nominee. But of course, none of the votes matter if they aren't counted correctly. <coughs> Iowa. Luckily, <laughs> according to state officials, they've got this thing under control. New Hampshire Secretary of State Bill Gardner, he told us he slept well last night and today's voting will be simple and secure. Keep it simple. Keep the moving parts the smallest number you can. Could this be hacked in any way? You can't hack a pencil. How many apps do you have involved in this process? Uh, we don't have any apps involved <laughs> in any of the tabulating of the counting. No apps. No apps. It's an app-free election. You can guarantee that. Yes. You know, it's funny how a few years ago, People were like, guys, we need to vote with our phones. It's the future. But now, thanks to the disaster in Iowa, it's like, we're going back to how our forefathers did this, okay? <laughs> Everyone gets one rock and we put it in a jar. <laughs> yeah! Then our slaves count the rocks. What? Oh, too far back? Too far? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> too far back. For more on New Hampshire's big day, we go now to our correspondent who is live in the Granite State right now, Michael Costa, everybody! <laughs> Michael, you're on the ground in New Hampshire. What is the energy like? Hey, Trevor, I am not gonna lie. Today's been pretty stressful for the Democratic candidates. In fact, Joe Biden was so tense, he gave himself a surprise massage. You know? <laughs> well, it makes sense, Costa, because thanks to Iowa, there's so much more riding on this primary. Well, and not only that, but the candidates have had only a one week to completely change their cultural messaging. Because Iowa is mostly white people, but New Hampshire is mostly white people. <laughs> I don't, I don't get the difference. It sounds like both states are just a bunch of white people. Wow. 
Trevor, just a bunch of white people? That is so insulting. First off, it's not a bunch. The collective noun for white people is a gluten of white people. <laughs> and second, white people are not a monolith. We are a rich tapestry of ethnic diversity. Let, let me show you on my Caucasian color wheel, okay? Now, see, the, the New Hampshire white people fall here in the eggshell section while the Iowa whites are all the way over here in the oatmeal cream section. Uh, Costa, that's just basically a blank circle. White is not blank, Trevor. Zero is not nothing. Free to go is not innocent of all charges, although you do, you do hear that a lot when you're white. I mean, how, how would you feel if I said there was no difference between black people in South Africa and black people in... Uh, What's another country with black people? Well, there's this one. Okay, okay. This one? I never heard of it, but I'm sure this <laughs> one is a beautiful country. Okay, look, Costa, I'm not saying there's no difference. I just don't understand how the candidates campaign differently in New Hampshire versus Iowa. It's a totally different ball game. For, for example, in Iowa, you can say, it's great to be here in Iowa, but that's not gonna fly in New Hampshire. <laughs> Yeah, are you right? That does seem like a challenge. And then there's the voters. Remember, you're talking to very different groups of people. Iowans are rural, while New Hampshireites are not urban, okay? <laughs> Iowans, Iowans are blue collar, but New Hampshireans are working class. Plus, Iowans call it pop, and New Hampshireinos call it soda. They're, they're basically different planets. I, I, I don't know about that, Michael. A lot of people don't agree with your assessment. For instance, how would you respond to the criticism? that these predominantly white states aren't the best states to kick off the primaries, because these candidates could be starting in a more representative state of the country, like, like California or, or Florida. I, I hear what you're saying, Trevor. And yes, Iowa and New Hampshire are white, but hear me out. They're all so boring as hell, okay? <laughs> and that's what we want. We don't want our candidates going to fun states like Florida or California. If you got to spend a year campaigning in Miami, everyone would be running for president. <laughs> But if you're willing to spend a year eating bland food in sub-zero temperatures pretending to care about how big a pumpkin is, that's how I know you really want to be president, okay? And that's why the road to the White House has to go through here, Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, no, Costa, you're in New Hampshire. What? Uh, who cares? These places are all the fucking same, anyway. Michael Costa, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Daily Show. It's February, which is officially Black History Month. And we're celebrating all month with Roy Wood Jr. honoring the unsung heroes of black history in another episode of CP Time. Ah, welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Today, we'll be discussing black explorers. Now, I know when a lot of people think of explorers, they only think of white people, like Christopher Columbus, Lewis and Clark, or that twitchy lady that drives the magic school bus. <laughs> but what many people don't know is that black people have also been instrumental in discovering new lands. They just don't get any of the credit. Like how I discovered the Dougie, and no one gave me credit. I was covered in spiders, and I was just trying to get them off me. <laughs> Our first black explorer is a man by the name of Matthew Henson, the first man to reach the North Pole in 1908. It was an incredible feat, not just because he discovered the North Pole, but also because he was a black man who wasn't afraid of going head to head against winter. <laughs> the only place I would want to discover is Miami. <laughs> Party in the city where the heat is on. Another black explorer who doesn't nearly get the credit he deserves was an enslaved man named York. In 1804, he joined Lewis and Clark on their famous expedition across North America, making him the first black man to travel across the U.S. continent. York was a vital part of the expedition. In fact, he was so trusted, he was even given his own gun which was a risky move on Lewis and Clark's part. You giving a slave a gun. You know what you call a slave with a gun? Master. 
Interesting fact. After the expedition, York requested his freedom from Clark, but Clark denied it because he realized that without York, he would just be another white dude lost in the forest, like a bitch. And finally, black people weren't just tagging along with white people on these expeditions. They were also making history themselves. Like Abu Bakari II, the ruler of the Mali Empire. In 1311, Abu Bakari set off on an expedition westward. Eventually, he landed in Brazil. Abu Bakari met the native tribes there and made peace with them, and even ended up marrying a chief's daughter, a quest that many men know all too well, traveling to distant lands for new booty. <laughs> the local girls are too familiar. So the next time you think about explorers, remember not to just give credit to white men who discovered places people already lived, Columbus, but also give credit to those of the more melanin persuasion who have explored the world, like my Uncle Bebo, who in 1990 traveled across the country searching for the Dairy Queen with the best Oreo blizzard. <laughs> we haven't seen him since. That's why every day I honor my Uncle Bebo by eating one of these. We gonna miss you, Bebo. And we're, oh. And I'm back. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Roy Wood Jr., and this has been CP Time. And remember, before the culture, somebody give me some hot tea to balance out this cold. <laughs> Roy Wood Jr., everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Daily Show. The New Hampshire primary gave life to Bernie, Pete, and Amy Klobuchar. But while the New Hampshire giveth, it also taketh away. The race is getting smaller as of last night's results. We did see uh, the suspension or termination of presidential campaigns by Andrew Yang and Senator Michael Bennett. Tonight is not gonna be our night, but let me say this to New Hampshire, you may see me once again. You know, I am the math guy, and it is clear tonight from the numbers that we are not going to win this race. <laughs> we'll be back soon. In the meantime, though, thank you all. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. I'm not gonna lie, I, I don't get why candidates always say they'll be back when they know they won't. <laughs> no, I know they don't want to seem like a loser, but why not just be honest, you know? Why not just be like, New Hampshire, you guys are never gonna see me ever again. <laughs> like, they, it's the same problem with movie villains. Even when they're falling off a cliff or a building at the end, they're like, I'll be back. No, no, you won't. No, you won't. Like, it would be nice if they were honest. Just like, you and your family are safe forever. <laughs> but even though he's gone, Andrew Yang did leave a lasting impression on the 2020 race, right? His plan for universal basic income made a big splash. And it even had an impact in the real world. You see, he gave several families $1,000 a month for a year to test out his plan. And we sent Ronnie Chang to find out how it went. Yesterday, Andrew Yang dropped out of the 2020 presidential race, and I'm a little sad about it. Last year, I met him in person, and there was just something about the guy that made me trust him. Not to mention, I really wanted that free money he was promising. Every American adult at the age of 18 should get $1,000 a month, free and clear, from the government to do whatever they want. Making it rain! It's called UBI, or Universal Basic Income. And although the dream died with Yang's campaign, a few lucky families did get $1,000 a month for a year as a test program, like the Fassi family of New Hampshire. Uh, basically, he gave us a check for $1,000 a month from January until December of 2019. We went to his New Year's Eve party, and so that's how we got our first check, was at midnight. He wrote a check and gave it to yeah. you physically. And then after probably three months, he was getting really busy. He forgot, he about, forgot us. about us. What? He didn't, he didn't pay on time? Yeah, it was yeah. very odd sending out a message like, hey, you owe us money. So you guys were like, hey, asshole, where's my free money? And we said it much, much like, nicer than that. Oh, hey, asshole, where's my free money? <laughs> so how hard did Chuck and Jody ball out with their $12,000? Did you buy a Tesla, buy a snowmobile, maybe buy a Tesla snowmobile? No, I, we spent 90% of it on our daughter's college tuition. College tuition, I guess that's pretty good. Uh, what else? Spent a little bit 
on groceries, buying some healthier choices. Kombucha and some uh, soy yogurt. Isn't yogurt and kombucha for shitting? Digestion. Um, it's for digestion. So now that the money stopped, you must be pretty backed up, right? But luckily for Chuck's colon, he was so inspired by his UBI experience that he learned how to brew his own kombucha. <laughs> and it is potent. Just, what is it? It's a big blob of bacteria that's been sitting in some fermented tea in my bathroom for about six weeks. <laughs> bathroom juice aside, these people spend their UBI on college, groceries, and paying bills. What a bunch of idiots! It's like they don't even know what flexing means. You guys could be in head to toe supreme right now. Do you know what supreme is? No. No. Fuck. That's how you flex to your neighbors and make them jealous. That's what money's for. Okay, Chuck? Okay, Jody? But believe it or not, falling out is the last thing on most Americans' minds. Half of American adults say they can't even cover an unexpected $400 expense. Clearly, if you give people $1,000 a month, they would spend it on necessities, with a few exceptions. What else did you buy? Um, I Chucky took joined. improv classes, so I've been doing that for the last <laughs> eight months. You took improv classes? Yeah, mindful improv classes. What the fuck does that mean? It means we do self-appreciations, we do vulnerabilities. Ugh. Um, it's taught by a yoga teacher. Oh, oh my god. Andrew Yang may be out of the presidential race, but his ideas live on, and Americans deserve a shot at universal basic income. Well, maybe not all Americans. How you doing? Hello. Oh, I lost my hand. I hate improv. That's it for the Daily Show Global Edition. Before we go, some troubling news out of China, where fears over the coronavirus have led to a global shortage of protective masks. That's why I wear this protective mustache on my face. It stops germs from getting in, and sometimes soup gets stuck in there too. And I get a little afternoon snack for free. <laughs>